I hope by the end of this message that we will see indeed motivation does matter a great deal. So we're going to just consider the different motivations that are around for people to follow Christ or be Christians. And then we will look at biblical examples of these wrong motivations, different motivations and how they, where they lead to. We will then look at a correct motivation, the correct motivation. And then at the end, I would like to share a few gold nuggets with you that inspire me in my motivation. So if you are struggling in different points of your Christian walk, if things are difficult, you're finding um, the path of Christ a little hard, then it will, it, this message, as especially when we get to the end of it, will probably provide some answers of why it is hard and how it can be easier. And these, for me, in, at, at least, are very, very valuable to me because... Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's hard without this. It's actually impossible without these correct motivations, and and they mean so much to me as well as uh, others that have gone before in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. So motivation matters. Some people are motivated to be Christians to please their mum and dad. It's sort of the family tradition. It's a, it's a heritage. You've got a heritage of Christian um, uh, activities, and and it, it's something that you do just to to keep that going, or uh, it's it's just a habit. You've been uh, raised as a Christian. It's just all you know. Now, this motivation has flaws in it. Now, I'm not saying that it, it it's. There is benefits in being raised in a Christian home and, and having a Christian heritage. There is benefits to that. But if that is the motivation, then there will be problems with that motivation, as we discuss, we'll find out later. And I just want to make a note here that not every motivation is, is plain before your own eye. Sometimes you might think, what is actually motivating me? And that is a question. What, what does motivate you to come here? What is the, what is the motivation that that um that makes you become a christian or follow christ what what is the impetus or the stimulus for your spiritual exercises for your religion what is what is it that promotes christianity to you these questions that i want you to ponder during this message for you personally what is it that drives you others prefer, pro, uh, profess to be christians to avoid the punishment to, to avoid suffering. They sort of see it as, a, as an option of, of having God as your helper so all your obstacles will be solved and, and you'll have an easy life here on earth. And this is, a, this is a motivation for many people to become Christians because there are many things that God is proposing or promising to do for he, those who follow Him that attracts people and people f follow Him on that point. They want to avoid uh, hellfire or they want to avoid certain consequences they think that if they do something wrong then they their christian faith can can uh, just make matter, make consequences disappear by a, by a forgiveness uh, forgiveness definitely takes away guilt and suffering but it doesn't take away certain consequences in this life it takes away the consequence of eternal death only because jesus had to take that place but here on earth it doesn't but some people this is what motivates them. This is the stimulus to become Christians. Others are Christians because of the rewards. I mean, you, you, we're offered eternal life here, so um, isn't that an attraction? How many here want eternal life? To live in heaven, where there's no suffering and no pain, to have a, 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 a mansion in, in the heavenly city. Is that what you want? Is that your motivation? Because if it is your motivation, there's problems with that one also. Others become Christian or take the name of Christ to obtain possessions or positions, popularity, power, praise, all these things. Uh, people see that if, if I come into the, the Christian network, I can build myself up into a position of popularity. If I have certain talents and I, I enter into this 
Christianity, then others will actually see me and praise me and, and, and I, I like that. Or I might be able to slide up the rank of certain organizations within Christianity and have power, have people under me helping me and, and doing what I tell them to do. And, and many people get a kick out of power. So this is a motivation and it may not be just something obvious. It, this can be a, a, the deep-seated um, powerhouse in your, in, your, in your experience. Some become Christians for money. They need a job and a pastoral job will just suit them fine. They have the flexibility of arranging their schedule and they get lots of meals when they go to people's houses and a pastoral job can can have its perks and so people think yeah i want to become a pastor i'll enter into a theology course and and, and do three years of of training and then i come out church will pick me up somewhere hopefully and i'll be a pastor and the motivation is because it's a job it's a source of income or others might say well here I can start my own ministry and I have, I have a sort of a, a view on the Bible that no one else seems to have and I think there's a niche for me here and I can start a ministry, I can start a following and, and from this following I can uh, slide in the, uh, uh, funnel in the, the funds to, to my pocket. Unfortunately, this motivates people in, in the realm of Christianity some people are Christians because they figure, well, Jesus, I, I love Jesus because he loves me. Jesus has been kind to me. Jesus has served me. So it's only right for me to serve him back. And so, you know, what goes around comes around. Jesus has been nice to me and I need to give him some service. And therefore, I will be a Christian because of his kindness to me. Now, you might think, well, what's wrong with that? Well, later we'll find out that there's a problem with that one also. Because we often can get great satisfaction just from missionary work. And so we become Christians because we love the kick of service. The, the, the satisfaction of helping someone else feeds me. And that is my motivation. I love to get a, a satisfactu- uh, satis- satisfaction from, from helping other people. Others see Christianity as a great altruistic option at the smorgasbord of religions. I'm a Christian because I'm not a Muslim. And when you've got to go to hospital, well, you've got to say what religion you are. And, well, I'm just a Christian because what else will I be? I'm not a Buddhist and I'm not a Hindu and uh, I'm definitely not Muslim. So, oh, well, Christian sounds good. And this also is a motivation. But with all these motivations, there are fundamental problems with these. Now, I invite you to turn your Bible to Leviticus chapter 10. And we read of an example here of two people who were born into the priestly line of Aaron in Leviticus chapter 10. And their names are Nadab and Abihu. And they were the sons of Aaron, as the Bible will tell us in Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 1. And we're going to read to verse 3 and then verse 5. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, this is, uh, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will, sanct- I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. And then verse 5, So they went near and carried them out in their coats, out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron, and unto Eliezer, Uncover not your heads neither rend your clothes lest ye die and lest wrath come upon all the people so here were Aaron's sons and they were they were ministering in the sanctuary just like Aaron did and here they came and they they were slack in their ministry and 
they were killed. And so God told Aaron, don't mourn for your sons. Don't rend your garments. Don't do this. Because they have died because they have lowered the standard of the priests. And this is the tendency. When we come to Christianity with the motivation of, of doing it because my father's done it and I'm born into this and I'm just going to take over what he's done, uh, then there is a tendency of lowering the standard. I'm sixth generation Seventh-day Adventist. My father is Adventist minister. And I'm just born into Adventism. And the challenge to me is, is, is this my motivation to be an Adventist Christian? Is that what's motivating me? Because if it is, then the tendency for me to lower the standards will, will be there. Notice what Ellen White has to say on this point in, in the book Conflict and Courage, page 100. And he, she writes about Nadab and Abihu and it says, Next to Moses, Aaron, uh, sorry, next to Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu had stood highest in Israel. They had been especially honoured by the Lord, having been per uh, permitted with the 70 elders to behold His glory on the mount. But, th but their transgression was not therefore to be excused or lightly regarded. All this rendered their sin more grievous, because men have received great light, because they have, like the princes of Israel, Ascend, ascended to the mount and being privileged to have communion with God and to dwell in the light of His glory, let them not flatter themselves that they can afterwards sin with impunity. That because they have been thus honoured, of honored, God will not be strict to punish their iniquity. This is a fat, fatal deception. Nadab and Abihu had had not in their youth been trained of habits of self-control, habits of self-indulgence, long cherished, obtained a hold upon them, which even the responsibility of the most sacred office had, not pow had no power to break. They had not been taught to respect the authority of their father, and they did not realize the necessity of exact obedience to the requirements of God. The exact obedience. This is what happened to Nadab and Abihu. Yes, their upbringing wasn't the best. And unfortunately, most people that are born into Christian homes, their upbringing isn't the best. And therefore, the, to be exactly obedient. You think, well, we're Christians. We love God. We're a bit flexible here. Not at all. God designed to teach the people that they must approach Him with reverence and with awe. And in, his appointed, and in his own appointed manner, he cannot accept partial obedience. It was not enough that in this solemn season of worship, nearly, nearly everything was done as he directed. Let not one deceive himself with the belief that a, that a part of God's commandments, that a part of God's commandments are non-essential, or that he will accept a substitute for that which he has required. This is seen also in the, in the experience of the early church. The apostles, they received from Jesus the pure truths. And then as the generations went on, what happened to the church? Did the standard get higher or lower? It always gets lowered. And I read another statement from Great Controversy. Great Controversy, page 384, and I'm going to go into 385. Notice what the pen of inspiration says here. It says, During the lives of the apostles, the church remained comparatively pure. But toward the latter end of the second century, most of the churches assumed a new form. The first simplicity disappeared. And insensibly, as the old disciples retired to their graves, their children, along with new converts, came forward and new modeled the cause. Unfortunately, you see this happen in every church that calls itself Protestant. It says, To secure converts, the exalted standard of Christ's faith was lowered, and as a result, a pagan flood flowed into the church, carried with, it, carrying, uh, carried with its customs, practices, and idols. 
As the Christian religion secured the favor and support of secular rulers, it was nominally accepted by the multitudes. But while in appearance Christians may, but while in appearance Christians may remain in substance, sorry, while in appearance Christians many remained in substance pagans, especially worshiping in secret their idols. And unfortunately, this is what has taken place in the churches today. She writes in the next paragraph, Has not the same process been repeated in nearly every church calling itself Protestant? How many people in the church are motivated in this way? That we're a child of, I have, we have a line of, of um, a, a descent in the church and now we can just start lowering the standard getting more converts and 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 um, bringing the world into the church unfortunately those who have been motivated on this have done exactly that as the founders those who possess the true spirit of reform pass away their descendants came forward and new modeled the cause this can be clearly seen in the history of the advent church the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church held a standard which we don't hold today. It's not held today. Why? Because the children of those people and the children of, the, of, of their children have just come and, and dropped the standard. They're, they're Adventists because they were just born Adventists. And this has been the motivation of their continuance in the church what happened to Nadab and Abihu they died do you suppose that if this is our motivation in Christianity that we will be saved not at all not at all this motivation only leads to death as shown in the biblical example of Nadab and Abihu Now others come to the church because of popularity. One man called Judas came to the disciples. What was motivating him to be a follower of Christ? I read from Desire of Ages, page 293. 293. And it says, while Jesus was preparing, the disciples for their ordination, one who had not been summoned urged his presence among them. It was Judas Iscariot, a man who, prof uh, who professed to be a follower of Christ. He now came forward, soliciting a place in the inner circle of disciples. With great earnestness and, a and apparent uh, sincerity, he declared, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Jesus neither repulsed nor welcomed him, but uttered only the mournful words, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Judas believed Jesus to be the Messiah, but by joining the apostles, he had hoped to secure a high position in the new kingdom. This hope Jesus designed to cut off by the statement of his poverty. Right here is a motivation of coming to Christ. Here I can take a position. And many people today run on the same motivation. Whether they know it or not, it's, an, it's the underlying current of their focus on God. And what is, how is it revealed? When they don't get their positions, how do they act? They're bitter. That's the motivation. And so we see that Jesus told him straight out, the birds and the foxes are better off in possessions than the followers of Jesus. Understand that. If you're after position, don't follow the Lord. You'll only have a bitter end. If this is the motivation, either change your motivation or stop following Christ. Because what did Jesus say about Judas? It was better... That you were never born. Pretty strong words. Because all he did in coming to the Christian faith was only damage himself. 
So we must think, what, does motivation matter? Does it matter? It matters huge. It matters your whole life. It matters. I'll read another statement from Conflict and Courage, page 113. Sorry, 317. Judas was highly regarded by the disciples and had great influence over them. He himself had a high opinion of his own qualifications and looked upon his brethren as greatly inferior to him in judgment and ability. They did not see their opportunities, he thought, and take advantages of circumstances. The church would never prosper with such short-sighted men as leaders. Peter was impetuous. He would move without consideration. John, who was treasuring up the truths that fell from Christ's lips, was looked upon by Judas as a poor financier. Matthew, who, whose training had taught him accuracy in all things, was very particular in regard to honesty. And he, was, and he was ever contemplating the words of Christ and became so absorbed in them that, as Judas thought, he could not be trusted to do sharp, far-seeing business. Thus Judas summoned up as thus Judas summed up all the disciples and flattered himself that the church would often be brought into perplexity and embarrassment if it were not for his ability as a manager. This is the thought process. And if, if you can recall in this, if you if you look at your brethren and think, Yeah, they're not very good there, and and and, and we put other people down in their abilities and say, you know, I'm really the best person for the job then it is most likely that your motivation is the same as Judas. Something to consider. What is your motivation? What motivates you to follow Christ? Is it something like that? Do you lower the standards? Do you, do you teach a, 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 a Christianity or an Adventism belief that is lower than what was held? If that's the case... If we're lowering the standard, then our motivation often is just we're there just to to continue what we're we're doing. It's just a a uh, done by habit. But if I'm there and I assess my brethren and look down upon people, then my motivation is highly likely to be position, praise, and power. Review and Herald, October five. It makes a short statement here. Review and Herald. October 5, 1897, paragraph 7, it says, Christ's last journey to Jerusalem. Christ's last journey to Jerusalem. Whether he went with his disciples to attend the Passover feast was a fatal error for Judas. Not that it needed to be thus, but he made himself, sorry, but he himself made it so by his own course of action. The dissensions which frequently arose among the disciples as to which of them should be greatest was generally created by Judas. So you hear about the disciples fighting who's going to be the greatest, who's going to sit on the right hand or on the left hand and who's going to have these positions. It was generally stimulated by Judas underneath. Yes, all the disciples were going on and, and you know, but Judas was there just, it was an underlying issue for him. And he'd stirred these issues up of who was going to be the greatest. What was the end of Judas? He had a horrible death. Guilt. Sorrow. He hung himself. Then as he fell, he burst into pieces and the dogs came and ate him. Does the motivation matter? What is your motivation? Others are motivated by money. Turn to Second Peter chapter two and verse fifteen. Wages. And people who are motivated like this generally talk most of finance and about the accounts and, and people not paying tithe and, and all these other things. That's really their primary focus. Tithe is important, offerings are important for God, but we must serve God 
without reference to filthy lucre or not do it for money the bible says second peter chapter 2 and verse 15 we read of a class of people which have forsaken the right way and are, and are gone astray following the way of balaam the son of Besor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness he was a motivation balaam was a prophet of god balaam made a very nice outward show of his faith and i want to read it to you here in conflict of courage page three uh, 113 So speaking of Balaam, now if, if you haven't heard of the story of Balaam, Balaam was, was asked or solicited by the king of the Moabites to come and curse Israel because Israel were coming and they were afraid of them that they would take over their city and, and he wanted someone to come and curse them so he knew of Balaam who served the same God and solicited him to come and curse the people and Balaam knew clearly that he wouldn't do it but the thing that got him was what the king offered him the wealth but notice it says the second time time Balaam was tested he sent them away saying no the first time the second time Balaam was tested in response to the solicitations of the ambassadors he professed great conscientiousness and integrity so on outward appearance you look wow this guy really serves God he's a really genuine fellow assuring them that no amount of gold or silver could induce him to go contrary to the will of god so externals if you were ask him are you driven by money oh no i'm not but he longed to comply with the king's request and although the will of god had already been definitely made known to him he urged the messengers to tarry that he might further inquire of god as though the infinite one were a man to be persuaded he says just hang on a minute i'm going to go and ask god and and see if he lets me okay i'll do it because i i love god and i want to serve him so much so i'm going to go and ask him again <laughs> and here it continues in the night season the lord appeared to balaam and said if the men come to thee uh, call thee rise up and go with them but Yet the word which I shall give thee, thou shalt, uh, that shalt thou do. Thus far the Lord would permit Balaam to follow his own will, because he was determined upon it. He did not seek to do the will of God, but choose his own course and then endeavor to secure the sanction of the Lord. This is a dangerous thing. When we go to the Lord too many times of something that he has already clearly revealed, no. And we just try and say, well, maybe we look at it this angle or that angle. And we go to God and sort of try and really plead with him. The danger is that he'll actually let us do it. But it never was what he wanted. The best thing is to obey first up. It says there are thousands at the present day who are pursuing a similar course. Thousands today in the Christian realm who are motivated because of wealth and money thousands they would have no difficulty in understanding their duty but if it were in uh, if it were in harmony with their inclinations it is plainly set before them in the bible or is clearly indicated by circumstance or reason but because these evidences are contrary to their own desires and inclinations they frequently set them aside and presume to go to god and learn their duty with gr with great apparent conscientiousness they pray long and earnestly for light but god will not be trifled with he often permits such people to follow their own desires and to suffer the result when one clearly sees a duty let him not presume to go to God with a prayer that he may be excused from performing it. He should rather, with humble, submissive spirit, ask for divine strength and wisdom to meet its claims. What is motivating you in your Christian walk? This has been the motivation 
in the uprising of Catholicism. If you read with me in Revelation, we read in the Christian church, the events unfolding in the Christian church, the seven periods of the Christian church. And we come to the period of Pergamos, which is in the time where Constantine became a Christian. And I'm sure the bishops and the elders of the church were quite happy to have the emperor attend their church. But we read here in this time when the emperor was married to the church, to Christianity, there was this doctrine that started arising. And we read in Revelation 12, sorry, 2, not 12, Revelation 12 and starting in verse, sorry, Revelation 2, starting in verse 12, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write these things, saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. Notice that. What, what does he have? The sharp sword with two edges. And then he says this, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou behold, and thou beholdest, uh, holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. This is talking of Rome. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So here God's saying, look, you've got this doctrine of Balaam, the mode of this principle of Balaam, the teaching of Balaam, that, that brought Israel's ruin at the end because he did it for money. And so we have right here, before the, the papal church really was established by 538, we see the beginnings of this mentality of Balaam. The emperor's there. He's got lots of money. Let's just assess and change our doctrines according to the emperor. And this was done on numerous occasions where the emperor just had the way, he, he had his way because of the influence and the wealth that he brought to the Christian church. Because before Constantine, who was emperor? Diocletian. And what did Diocletian do? He, he persecuted the church like almost no other emperor did. So from going to major persecution to then actually winning the emperor over, you do everything to keep him in the church. And this is a motivation. And this has led the church to, be, to, teach, to teach people what they want to hear so they can get their money. And to turn the truth of God into wages. And now the Catholic Church is the richest institution on the planet. All because of this motivation. What happened to... What happened to Balaam? He was killed in the battle between Israel and the Moabites. He was killed. So does motivation really matter? It sure does. Motivation matters. Now some people want to be Christians because of the reward. Some Christians want to be um, want to follow the Lord because it's just the thing to do. It's, it, God has been kind. The, the principles of, of Christianity are, are, are nice and there's a good thing about it. But notice that this motivation is wrong. Read in, in Matthew chapter 5 with me. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5 and verse 43 to 48. Sorry, yes. Matthew chapter 5. Some people love Jesus because he loves them. He's kind to them, so they're going to be kind back. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 5 and reading in verse 43 to 48. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be children of your Father 
which is in heaven. For he maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth his rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye do more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, it is true, it is of a truth that we love him because he first loved us. That is written in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. And there, there is a good side to this motivation because we awaken to the love of God. But if this is our only motivation, just because God is kind to me, I'll be kind back, it will fail when God doesn't appear to be nice to me. Read in Luke chapter 6 and verse 32. Same account, but written in a slightly different way. It says, Luke 6 and verse 32 through to 35. We read, For if you love them which love you, what thank, ye, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye, ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful." So if our motivation is purely based on just the kindnesses that Christ has done to me, the blessings, you know the song, count your blessings, name them one by one. It is good to count your blessings. But don't make this the motivation for your service to Christ. Because when those blessings disappear, then what's going to motivate you? Because sinners do that. If you're kind to a sinner, he'll be kind back to you. What's the big deal? Is that Christianity? No, Christianity is blessing those that hate you. And so Christ will test this by coming to us as an enemy. Did he do that to Jacob? You recall when Jacob wrestled with the angel? How did the angel who was, when we do a biblical study on this angel of the Lord, we find out that it's actually Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came to to Jacob, after Jacob's really stressed out, he has great perplexities and he's separated his families into two companies and he's left alone and he's fearing for his life because his brother's going to come and kill him and he's praying to the Lord to save him. And how, in what way does Christ come to Jacob? As an angel of light to come and just bless him? Is that how he did it? He came as an enemy, came and started wrestling with him. And if you're afraid for your life, you're in the dark, you're expecting 400 men with your angry brother to turn up at any time and kill you, and you're in the bush in the dark and someone starts wrestling with you, who do you suppose that would be? One of the enemies. And so this is the way. Now, if, if Jacob was just motivated in his love for God, just for what God had done for him, then he wouldn't have been able to hang on to this angel and say, when he realized, hey, this is actually not an enemy. This is, this is actually God testing me. I'm going to hang on. I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. Although you've just dislocated my hip, I'm not going to let you go. We love God's kindness. He gives us benefits. He gives us to love tokens to us. But what if he walked up to you and just, and just dislocated your arm? Then you think, oh, that's not nice. Well, what's motivating you? Is it because, well, he's kind of me, I'm kind back? It will fail. Yes, this is this thing that initiates our walk with God. His love to us awakens love in ourselves. But we must develop into a motivation which is far deeper than just being liked and kind action to me.
Bless those that persecute you and hate you and do all manner of things against you. That is the, f- that, that is the foundation of Christianity. And so we see the parable of the sower. You probably recall the parable of the sower. When the seed fell in the stony ground, Jesus gave the comparison. He says it's like a hero when he hears the word and with joy he immediately just takes it and thinks, this is great. Christianity is wonderful. It's such a kind, compassionate sort of principles. I really like this. But what kills that seed that grew in the stony ground? When persecution and trials come, they can't endure. They give up. The motivation of that seed to grow was purely just based on the benefits given in Christianity. I read in Christ Object Lessons, page 47, paragraph 2. It says a beautiful quote here. Many receive the gospel as a way of escape from suffering rather than as a deliverance from sin. Do you want to give up all your sins, even the ones you love? Because your motivation will determine whether that happens or not. If you look at Christianity as just a way of relieving suffering, but you don't want to give up your secret cherished idols, then Christianity will only make you sorry. They rejoice for a season, for they think that religion will free them from difficulty and trial. While life moves smoothly with them, they may appear to be consistent Christians, but they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation. They cannot bear reproach for Christ's sake. When the Word of God points out some cherished sin or requires self-denial or sacrifice, they are offended. It would cost them too much effort to make a radical change in their life. They look at the present inconveniences and trials and forget the eternal realities. Like the disciples who left Jesus, they are ready to say, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? This is hard. This this type of Christianity I don't like. I like the one that scratches my ears. If this is your motivation, then this should make you aware that you will fail if this is your motivation you will fail now some people want to go to heaven do you want to go to heaven is this your motivation to have eternal life read with me in the book of luke this amazing story experience that jesus made in luke chapter 18 and verse 18 luke 18:18 18, 18. And here we see a story of a rich young ruler. Now this man was also born in the faith and from his youth up, from his childhood up, he had habitually done things, which was also a bad motivation. But notice it led on to another motivation. It says here in verse 18, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What does the man want? Eternal, eternal life? Is that a bad thing? Is it bad to want to live forever? No. But notice that he, this is his motivation. He sees it sort of as a possession to gain. I mean, I've got lots of things and I would just like this one too. And notice what Jesus says to him. Why callest thou me good? There is uh, none is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honour thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these I have kept from my youth up. You notice how many Jesus said, how many, how many commandments are here recorded? Six? Five. There are five. Now he was taking, and and this man was obviously well acquainted with the Decalogue. And he took the last six, but he left out one. What was that? Thou shalt not covet. Now he would have went, "Mm, he's missing that one. Would have rung some bells in his ears because he just goes on to test him on that exact point of covetousness. 
So here Christ is testing him. He says, I've done this from a youth up. And then verse 22, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto them, Yet, yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast and distribute to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. He was attached to possessions and he saw eternal life as a very good possession to gain. He thought, this Christianity is great. I would love to inherit eternal life. What should I do? Be a Christian. Okay, I can be a Christian and go to church and do all these things. I can do all that because I want to go to heaven. I long for heaven. But he lacks something. He was asked to give everything to the poor. Sell everything he had and give it to the poor. Oh, he went away. Sorrowful. What was his reason to follow Christ? Eternal life. What was the result? Sorrow. If you're a Christian because you just want to go to heaven and have heaven as a possession, you will be very sorry. Just like the rich young ruler. Now Jesus then explains that it's very hard for a rich man to enter into heaven. Because it's hard to get away from the possession mentality. But then our merciful Jesus leaves this place and in the next chapter he goes to Jericho. And there, when he comes to Jericho, he demonstrates to the disciples that a rich man can be saved. But notice the motivation of this man in Luke 19. Luke 19 and verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the thieves. <laughs> That's how the Jews saw it. So he was a chief thief, a publican. He was chief among the publicans and he was rich. Now, what was Zacchaeus's motivation? And he sought to see Jesus who he was. I want to see Jesus. I'm interested in this character called Jesus of Nazareth. I'm very intrigued about him. I want to know who he is. I've heard a lot about him and I want to know him. Who he is. And so, notice this motivation. He wants to see who Jesus is. And he ran before and climbed up. Sorry, and he sought to see Jesus... Uh, uh, and could not for the press because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Now here's this short fellow and he's running. Does he have some motivation here? He's not just, I, I'll find a tree. Just He ran. He found the tree and he climbed up that tree. This man had some motivation behind him. What was his motivation? I want to know who Jesus is. I'm so interested in him that I'll run to meet this guy. And verse 5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste. <laughs> come quickly and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him. How? Joyfully. How did the rich young ruler receive Jesus? Oh, you know, I really would like heaven. But you know, Jesus, oh, this giving up to the poor business, I don't like that. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that that's an attribute of Jesus. That was the, what the rich young ruler's mind was. He was sorrowful. Why? Because his motivation was just to have eternal life. But here's Zacchaeus, his motivation is to see Jesus. And so when Jesus will come, well, I'm so happy about that. 
He's joyful. Now notice what this joyful motivation caused him to do. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. What did Jesus require of the rich young ruler? To give your things to the poor. Jesus had to tell him, this is what you have to do. Now he was sorry. That's a really hard thing. Here Zacchaeus, did Jesus tell Zacchaeus to give his riches to the poor? No. Why didn't he have to tell him? Because he had the correct motivation. Do you know if you're tired of people telling you what to do? Or you're tired of hearing all the instructions from God's word, then you don't have the right motivation. If Jesus is speaking to us and we want to get to know him, wouldn't that motivate us on that point as a person? This is a key to many difficulties in the Christian walk. If you're upset because someone comes into the church and takes your office, that sorrowful experience comes from the wrong motivation. That's why you get it. The motivation's the problem, not the person who came in and took your office. That's not the problem. Or if, if you're tired of high standards and you want to lower the standards to bring more converts into the church and, and, and you have difficulty with people who lift up the standard, then that difficulty you have with a high standard comes not from the people, not from the high standard. It comes from the wrong motivation. If we find that we, we really don't like persecution, we want our life to be rosy and anything that's difficult, anything that crosses my path or sacrifice I have to make for the cause of God, and I find it really hard to do that, some persecution to experience or trials to go through. The difficulty is not in the trial. The difficulty is in your motivation. In other words, motivation matters. It matters to an enormous level, what is driving you to be a Christian? If you want to see Jesus, hey, I'll give my stuff to the poor. I don't mind what I do. I just want Jesus. I'll return. I will make men's. Why? Because of the love of Jesus. Because I see who he is and I admire him. He has no thought of eternal life or, or, or of of the mansions in heaven and thinking, yeah, I'd really like that. So I'll give this as an investment. You know, I'll sort of give up to the poor and then I'm going to invest. And, and no, it's about Jesus. That's what it's about. And he received joyfully. Now we'll notice what Jesus says to him. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come into this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is came to seek and save that which was lost. This man was saved to see who Jesus was, to get to know him as a person. This is eternal life, to know Jesus Christ and the Father who sent him. So what is that motivation? Read with me in 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. And we think about this word love and it's a, it's a shame that we use this word in so many applications. You know, love. You know, we love our spouse. We love our friends. But you also love a hot dog. You know, I mean, this love is used. I mean, what's a hot dog compared to your spouse? But you love them both. You know, this word love is used in such a terrible way, really. So we read here. 1 Corinthians 13, and this talks about love, but it puts it in the framework of charity. Now, charity is an altruistic um, action which is opposite to egocentric. It's to benefit others. It's not about you. It's about other people, not about self. It's, and, and this is the motivation here. Charity, a love for someone else. Love for someone else. What motivated Jesus to come to this earth? Because he loved himself? Because he loved heaven? 
because he loved eternal life, because he loved God, is that what motivated him to come here? No, because he loved you. Even when you're not lovable, in most people's opinion. He loved you. That was the drive that drove him. That was the, the stimulus that brought him to Calvary. A love for you. That is Christianity. While you were his enemy, you didn't love him. That principle needs to be duplicated into us. That is who God is. Notice this. If that is missing, then any other thing we do in Christianity is worthless. Notice it says in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. The issue isn't in giving all your goods to the poor. That's not the issue. The issue is what motivates you to do that. And if you didn't do that, but you're motivated on the same principle in preaching or teaching, and, and the motivation is what counts because motivation matters. If, if you knew all the prophecies, all the doctrines perfectly, you had, you had so much faith that you could do all these miracles, you, if you gave your stuff to the poor, if you could preach brilliantly, would people call you a good Christian? Most people would, if that's what you could do. If you could teach well, you were eloquent with your speech, and, and you had these talents, and you gave g gifts to the poor, and you are generous... Wouldn't you be called a good Christian? You would be. But in God's sight, if you're not motivated by charity, it doesn't matter to Him. Everything is open before Him with whom we have to do. God's Word is a sharp sword and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Even the church, when they accepted Constantine in, God knew the hearts of the people. He knew the conversion of Constantine was fake. He saw it all. His sharp sword, the two-edged sword, dis determines what is the driving force in your following of him. He saw it in Judas. He just wants position. He just wants po popularity. He saw it in Balaam. He saw it in Nadab and Abihu. And he killed them. Will he see it in you? What's driving you? He'll see it. He sees it better than you see it. This is the time examine. What's driving me here? What is driving me? Notice this experience in, 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 of love in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. 1 John 3, 16. First John chapter 3 and verse 16. We read, Hereby perceive we the love of God. This is the perception. This is how we actually see it. The love of God, this charity. Because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In other words, the, the love that God had towards us in giving Himself to us, even when we were not kind to Him, is what we need to do to other people. That should be our driving force. Read with me in John, the Gospel of John 15. We'll turn there. John 15. John 15 and verse 13. And we read, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Do you want to go to heaven? Would you be willing to give up heaven for someone else? Honestly. You know, this isn't the, the tear-jerking story of saving someone in front of a train and diving out and catching them and then you dying physically because you saved that person. What a touching story. 
That's so not the love that God we're talking about. Because that person, yeah, well, he'll be raised and he'll go to heaven. and He's got another life. But would you be willing to, to give up your total eternal existence for someone else? That's challenging. But that's what the true motivation will do naturally. Look at Moses' example. Exodus. We'll just turn there quickly to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32. And starting in verse 10, God, God tests Moses on this point. When he's talking to Moses, the children of Israel have just sinned greatly. They've made the golden image, the calf. They've danced around it. They've, they've done all this wrong thing while Moses was on the mount. And in verse 10, and God is saying, uh, you know, leave me alone. I'm, gonna, I'm going to kill these people. It says in verse 10, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I'll make of thee a great nation. Now most of us will go, you know God, that's the best thing I've heard you say in a long time. Make a nation from me. That's great. I think I'm so good. I'd be a, I'd be a great uh, fountain of children. Is that what Moses said? How many of us would say that? If these desperate sinners disobeyed God, oh, but they just need to all die. I haven't disobeyed God, therefore I'm good enough to start my own movement. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with a great power and with a mighty hand? Now he's pleading with the Lord, come on. He's, he's, he's pleading on behalf of the people. But notice what Moses has to say in verse, in verse 31. And Moses returned, in verse 31 of Exodus 32, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive them, if thou, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. What does that mean? If your name is taken out of the book of life. That means you are forfeiting your eternal existence. Not just your temporal life here on earth that you'll go out and, and save someone at the cost of your life in a heroic way. No, this is actually to forfeit your eternal life for someone. Now Moses did this not thinking we're all going to hear this. This was, a genuine, this was a genuine statement. You know, we may say this hip, 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 um, in hypocrisy. Oh Lord, please be with them and take my name out of the book. If, you know, like it sounds really good. You know, Moses meant every word he said here. He meant every word. He said, take me out of heaven so they can go in. Do you have that love? The motivation, true motivation, will produce this type of love. Notice that the Apostle Paul in the New Testament had it also in Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 and verse 1 through to 3. Romans 9. I say the truth in Christ. Here he's making a statement that he means with all his heart. He's not faking this statement. I say... The truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ, that my bre uh, um, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. I would wish that I was accursed from Christ. What does that mean to be accursed from Christ? Do you think you would have eternal life if that took place? Not at all. For who? For the Jews. He loved them so much that he was willing that he wouldn't go to heaven so they could. And he meant every word he said. Do you have that love? This is challenging. What motivates you? Something else motivating you? Do you know what, gets, do you know what produces this? Getting to know Jesus. Did Jesus do the same thing? When Jesus went to Calvary for you and me, did he realize that he will come out the other side? He couldn't see through the portals of the tomb. 
as far as he as was concerned in his brain, he was going to die forever. I mean, yes, beforehand, he knew the prophecies and the scriptures that he would come out. Yes, he saw that from God's word. But when he went into the experience at, Cal- at, at Gethsemane and on Calvary, he couldn't see it anymore. It was blocked out from his vision. And now it was challenging for the father who I love so much. It's either I've got to be with them or you. These sinful, unthankful, unholy people would go and have the privilege of being with the father instead of me. What a challenge. Did Christ love the father? The father was everything to him. Everything. And he was willing to give up that position so you could have it. Is there greater love than that? That is the person who Zacchaeus wanted to see. That is the character that Zacchaeus desired to see. That was when he saw it, that was the thing that motivated him in doing everything. I mean, what does matter? If that's what Christ would do for me, then how much love would awaken if that is what stimulates me? If that love is true, disinterested love, not interested in myself, and love awakens love, what sort of love would awaken in your heart if you saw that in Christ? Would it be the same? And that comes our scripture reading. He that saves his life shall lose it. Does that include your eternal life? If you try and hang on to eternal life like a possession, just like the rich young ruler, if you like, you know, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want, you know, like other people are falling around, but as long as, as, long as I, I don't, then they can fall over, I don't mind, as long as I'm in heaven. And we're trying to save our life. What does the Bible say? We'll lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake... He shall find it. I mean, we can, the, the appreciation of heaven and the rewards of heaven is okay. But don't let it be your motivation. Because, you know, if you get Christ, you get everything that he also has. But if you just want what he has, then you're no different to Lucifer. I want to be like Jesus. Why? Because of what he had. Not of who he was. Lucifer never wanted to be like Jesus in character. He never wanted that. He just wanted everything else. What do you want? Do you want to be like Jesus? Or do you want just what he's got? Because if we're going to be like Jesus, well then we'll have everything he's got. But the motivation matters tremendously. It says in Desire of Ages, it says, it is not, page 480, it is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciple of Christ to follow him. They behold the Saviour's matchless love revealed through his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross and the sight of him attracts. It softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholder. They hear his voice and they follow him. The motivation between Judas and John was huge. John and Judas, conflict and courage 316, John and Judas are representatives of those who profess to be Christ followers. Here's two people, John and Judas. What are you? Both these disciples had the same opportunities to study and follow the divine pattern. Both were closely associated with Jesus and were privileged to listen to his teachings. Each possessed serious defects of character and each had access to the divine grace that transforms character. But while one in humility was learning of Jesus, the other revealed what he was, uh, the other revealed that he was not a doer of the word, but a hearer only. One, daily dying to self and overcoming sin, was sanctified through the truth. The other 
resisting and resisting the transforming power of grace and indulging selfish desires was brought into the bondage of Satan. Notice this. Such transformations of character as is seen in the life of John is ever the result of communion with Christ. There may be marked defects in the character of an individual, yet when he becomes a true disciple of Christ, the power of divine grace transforms and sanctifies him. Beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, he is changed from glory to glory until he is like him whom he adores. What's the difference? One is based on worship, one is not. What is worship? Worship is adoration. And so when the, when the last message is, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him. That simply means that it is time to adore Jesus. And when we adore His person and when we communicate Him as we get to know Him, this will sort out all your problems and will be the motivation to make every difficulty easy. So if you're having a hard time, check out what your motivation is and seek to adore Jesus. How do you adore him? By seeing his matchless charms. And so just briefly, I want to share a couple of nuggets with you to conclude. These things really, they're short and and precise but these really resonate in me that makes me love Jesus so much it's not about the, sh the streets of gold and the amazing walls of heaven and how big the city is I mean that's impressive but nothing beats the character of Jesus nothing can beat it and so it says we must look away this is signs of the times September 16 1889 we must look away from self to Jesus for he has provided that we may have joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. As we behold, notice this, as we behold the matchless charms of Jesus, we shall be changed into the same image. What do you have to do? Behold the matchless charms. You have to be charmed by him. Are you charmed by the character of Jesus? Does he charm you? It's amazing. Another statement, Faith and Works, page 107. When this... When the sinner, notice this, if you're having a hard time overcoming sin, this will be an answer to you. When the sinner has a view of the matchless charms of Jesus, sin no longer looks attractive to him. If you're battling with something where, oh, you know, I, I want to follow the Lord, but this sin is just brilliant. And I really like it. I mean, I, I just love it. But I, you know, I want to follow Jesus too, but this, oh, it's a, it's a darling to me. Well, if you want to overcome that, with, make it a lot easier than, than um, in overcoming, look at Jesus and be charmed by him. Then when you look back at that, it's like, ugh, that's yuck. And when it's yuck, is it hard to say no to? No, you, someone might bring a, a platter of your favorite food, uh, well cooked, and you're like, hmm. But if someone brought a platter of manure, would you be tempted so if you want your nice food to look like manure, then look at Jesus. This is just an example of making a good sin into bad, is what I'm trying to bring out here. Look at the matchless charms of Jesus. Now, these are the ones I wanted to share with you, these little gold nuggets. You want to write them down? They're brilliant. and You can meditate upon these ones. Notice this. As a child... This is from Desire of Ages, page 68. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb. Isn't that great? And a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock. His life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. Isn't that charming? It's just, just a child like that. That was Jesus. In ev this is Desire of Ages 85. 
In every gentle and submissive way, Jesus tried to please those with whom he came into contact. He liked to make people happy. Because he was so gentle, I love this, because he was so gentle and unobtrusive, the scribes and elders supposed that he would be easily influenced by their teachings. They urged him to receive the maxims and traditions that, he had, hand, that had been handed down from the ancient rabbis, but he asked them their authority in Holy Writ. He would, he would hear every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but he could not obey the inventions of men. Such a kind little boy, but no, I'm not going to disobey God. I'm going to obey God. I'll, make any, I'll do anything to make you happy except disobey God. Is that fair enough? That was Jesus. As a child, he just wanted to obey God and that was his attribute. This is from Desire of Ages, page 89. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Often his work, often his work was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. Sometimes Jesus just did it the hard way. Why? Because he didn't want to complain. If he made a complaint, perhaps it would become easier for him. He didn't want to complain. So he made so thing his work was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. Isn't that wonderful? If you dwell on these little gems, these little gold nuggets, it says, let the mind dwell. This is from Amazing Grace, page 293. Let the mind dwell upon his love and upon the beauty, the perfection of his character. Christ in his self-denial. Christ in his humiliation. Christ in his purity and holiness. Christ in his matchless love. This is the subject for the soul's contemplation. It is by loving him, copying him, depending wholly upon him, that you are transformed into his likeness. Here is Jesus. This is how Jesus interacted with children. Christ watched children at their play. He watched them play. And often expressed his approval when they gained an innocent victory over something that they were determined to do. He sang to the children in sweet and blessed words, this is from Upward Look, page 57. He sang to the children in sweet and blessed words. They knew that he loved him. They knew that he loved them. He never frowned at, on them. He shared their childish joys. Jesus, a, as an adult, he shared their childish joys and sorrows. And often, Jesus would gather flowers. And after pointing out their beauty to the children, would leave them with them as a gift. He made the flowers and he delighted to point out their beauty. This is Jesus, the creator of the universe, can just stop and, and pick a flower for a little child. There you go. That's Jesus. That's the creator of the universe. Like we think he's got other better things to do. He loves doing that. And these sort of things, they charm me. Like, this is my, this is my God. This is who I, I serve. The record of the childhood, this is youth instructor, 20, uh, the 23rd of, of August, 1894. The record of the childhood and youth of Jesus is to be an encouragement to all children and youth. Jesus is the perfect pattern. And it is his duty and privilege, it is the duty and privilege of every child and youth to copy the pattern. Let children bear in mind that the child Jesus had taken upon himself human nature and was in the likeness of sinful flesh and was tempted of Satan as all children are tempted. He understands children in their difficulties. He was tempted when children get restless and bored. So Jesus got tempted in that way. And he understands the difficulty Jesus was a perfect pattern of what we should be. He was the strictest observer of his father's law, yet he moved in perfect freedom. 
such so strict yet he didn't he wasn't in a straitjacket he moved with perfect freedom doing what god wanted him to do he had all the favor of the he had all the fervor of the enthusiast yet he was calm sober and self-possessed that means a lot to me sometimes i get a bit enthusiastic about things jesus had all that enthusiasm yet he was also calm Now this, if you just picture this in your mind, and we'll probably finish on this one. Just picture this in your mind. Christ has just gone to heaven. He's just been victory over, and made victory over the grave and of sin and of death and of Satan. He, he, he's triumphed at the cross and he goes to heaven. And it says, As he enters heaven, the angels hasten to do him homage. But he waves them back and going to his father makes the plea, Father, I will that thou also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest them, bef- that for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. What is the father's answer? Let all the angels of God worship him. Here he comes into the city. All the angels just want to worship him for his victory. And he says, hey, don't. I want to go and ask God to bring you and me to heaven. Don't worry about the praise and glory. I want my human family to be there. Does that touch your heart? That's Jesus. And there are so many gems here and I could preach for another two hours. But I won't. Because we need the right motivation. I hope you can see at the end of this that motivation does matter. And that if you be charmed by Jesus, you find out these little gold nuggets and you keep them written down somewhere. We can exchange them at the meal table. And when we're talking, we can just say the beautiful things about Jesus and what he's done, what we've learnt about Jesus. And as we admire him, my friends, we will be changed in his likeness and church problems will disappear. It is my prayer that we can have this motivation to be charmed by Jesus' sacrificial love. Amen.